What's going on everybody? Welcome back to Adventure Moto Southwest. My name's Patrick and today we're going to be doing an in-depth review of the Africa Twin. Hey everybody, welcome back. So the Honda Africa Twin, we're gonna cover a lot of information with this bike and we're gonna answer a lot of questions. How's the comfort? How's the wind protection? How's the seat height? Can you flat foot it? We'll go over the modifications I've done. We'll talk about how the ergonomics are on road and off. And of course, there's been some issues with this bike. I've had warranty work done on it. So we'll talk about what went wrong with it. Is it working now? How has it been? Let's get into it. So this is the Africa Twin base model, and I'll start with talking a little bit about why I got this particular bike. What I did is I actually made a list of things and features that I wanted in a bike and then narrowed it down based off of that. Um, so I was looking for something that had a relatively low seat height for this category. Um, and then I was coming off of a sport tour that had the Versus 1000, which was a great bike, but I did feel like I was limited whenever I would go on long road trips and I'd want to go explore uh, a dirt road somewhere. Obviously the Versus was just fine on um, forest roads and packed dirt, but anything more than that, it just wasn't what it was made for as a sport tour. So I wanted something that had some off-road capability. And a big requirement of mine was that it had to be able to take 86 octane fuel. Um, this was because uh, a buddy of mine and I went on a ride a couple years back in southern New Mexico, and there was a little stretch of highway where we were stretching the fuel ranges of our bikes and the gas station we got to luckily did have 91 octane fuel which is what the versus took that i was on at the time however if they didn't have that fuel type i would have been out of luck so moving forward i knew that the ability to take that 86 octane was pretty important to me so wind protection was also a factor i wanted at least a little bit to keep the wind off my chest on the highways so cruise control was also a bonus if it had that um, I do like having some sort of cruise control on my bikes and I've used a variety of different aftermarket types, but having it built into the bike is a lot better and preferable in my mind. And I wanted the ability to either add heated grips or it come with that already. So once I started looking, the Africa Twin um, hit the bill in a lot of those categories, but the thing I had a hard time with was the price of the Adventure Sports model. And I know it had a lot of those features already, like the heated grips and the larger fuel tank. However, I got a pretty great deal on this base model. It's a 2021 and it had been sitting at the dealership for about a year. And so they gave me a really, really good deal. Um, just under 13,000 out the door, brand new. And they installed a lot of the modifications, which we'll get into later, including the heated grips, as well as the crash bars and the skid plate. Uh, free of charge. I just had to supply the parts, but um, and they also included the first service as well, which is pretty nice. So let's talk about the technical aspects of this bike. 1100cc uh, parallel twin, about 100 horsepower and 76 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, I found that it has a lot of power down low. In general, the power isn't rip your arms off type power on the acceleration, but it's decent and it's certainly enough to pass on the highway and cruise around comfortably. For fuel economy, I tend to get about 44 miles per gallon, which is not bad. The suspension is a bit soft, but it could be adjusted. You'll definitely notice the bike taking a dive when I brake, and some say that the suspension might feel a bit vague feeling off-road, but I personally enjoy it, and I like that it soaks up a lot of the road imperfections. Uh, it does come with LED headlights that work really well at night. The ABS is able to be turned off for off-road use, However, it does reset each time you turn off the bike. I know that's a safety feature for on-road and not forgetting to turn it back on and all that, but it would be nice if this setting would sort of stick in the off-road modes once you turn the bike off and on. 
nice big TFT screen with Apple CarPlay, uh, which we'll get into later in the video because it definitely isn't perfect. You'll notice there's two screens here. The reason for that is because once you use Apple CarPlay, the top screen pretty much is used entirely by that and uh, the various apps you might be using like Google Maps and whatnot. So it's nice to have that bottom second screen so you can still see what gear you're in, miles per hour and all that. So let's talk about the tires. We got a 21 inch in the front and an 18 inch in the rear. So the tires are decent. Um, the ones it comes with are the Carew Streets and uh, they certainly aren't amazing off-road. On-road they are fine though. I've had no issues with traction, especially in wet weather. Off-road the front tire has trouble keeping a straight line but they are tolerable and totally fine for fire roads and gravel and things like that. Uh, I am currently looking for tire recommendations and would love to hear what you guys recommend for this particular bike. Um, I would like something that's a little more off-road capable without getting too far into the traction and wet riding sacrifices that kind of come with that type of tire. So essentially, if there's something you guys recommend that's just a level or two more off-road capable than the Carew Streets that it comes with, that would be amazing and that's kind of what I'm looking for. So let me know what you think because I'm coming up on that pretty soon. So the bike comes with a five gallon tank, which gets me on average a little over 200 miles depending on the type of riding I'm doing. I believe the Adventure Sport has a 6.5 gallon tank as well, which is really good. However, I felt the bike was already heavy enough without the extra gallon and a half of fuel. So I'm pretty happy with the five gallons so far. On to the weight of the bike, which is just over 500 pounds wet and you feel it, especially off-road. It's definitely not the bike I'm taking on single tracks and things like that. Uh, there's some trails that have steep inclines and deep sand near me that I ride without really a second thought on my Yamaha XT250, but kind of nervous to take this bike on those types of things. I've done it before, but I just have to take it pretty slow and be a lot more cautious. The bike, because of its weight, also tends to dig into the sand and mud and whatnot. So that is something to consider. Um, so the brakes are pretty good really have no issues with them plenty of stopping power so what types of riding do i do most with this um, there's three main types that i ended up doing mostly with this uh, currently it's moto camping because of its luggage and space that it has uh, i do longer tours and rides with it because it's really great on the highway and if that includes light duty off-road that works great um, the third category is commuting seriously like i do a lot of commuting on this bike um, I even plan to make a whole video about this, but it's honestly the best commuter bike I've ever had. And I know there's a joke in there somewhere about it's an adventure bike and uh, of course it's uh, a commuter and going to the coffee shop, but you know, it's really good for that. And honestly, the DC team makes crawling traffic that you would see during commutes really easy. Like your left hand doesn't get tired from holding in the clutch. Uh, so you don't have to deal with that. You can just crawl along as needed. There's good wind protection and heated grips and the bark busters that I put on provide good wind protection. Um, if you're commuting, there's good luggage space that I have on this bike for work stuff and change of clothes or storing shoes and whatnot. The ergonomics are great. Uh, you sit up nice and tall in a neutral position. There's no weight on your wrists. You uh, can see above traffic because you're up kind of high. Uh, there's plenty of power for passing both on the roads and freeways. Uh, it's really great. So for commuting, I have to give it a solid 10 out of 10. All right, just a brief overview of the dash. Starting over here, we have the e-brake, which is necessary for the DCT models. Um, just like your car, when you put it in park, uh, you do usually want to put an emergency brake on just in case so it doesn't roll because when you turn this bike off, you're not able to leave it in first gear. So you use this instead and it works well. Um, moving on up here, I do have this iPhone cord um, kind of just here permanently. It's going into the USB socket on the right side there. Um, this is for the Apple CarPlay. There are some things you can buy online that allow for wireless Apple CarPlay, but I've heard mixed reviews in terms of their reliability and their protection from weather. So this has been working well for me. I also have this giant loop pouch set up here and that's been extremely handy. I keep a garage door opener in there and I also store the cord in there as you can see. Um, and then moving over here, we have the power outlet. Um, this did not come with the base model, but I did negotiate that as part of the purchase agreement for them to install this Honda OEM part here. Uh, moving to the screens, 
You can see that there are the dual screens like we talked about earlier. The TFT is nice and bright and it does adapt to the available daylight and it will change with that. So that's it's been pretty, uh, pretty good and visible. I did add this accessory on. This is a Honda OEM part that actually comes stock with the Adventure Sports model, not the base, but it wasn't very expensive. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to, uh, one, offer better visibility to the screen. And then when I added this tall windscreen on, I read that the purpose of this is actually because um, the light can could potentially have a magnifying glass effect on the TFT. And so this shields it from that. I'm sure it would have been fine without, but I just took the precaution. And I do like that it, the screen is protected from sun a lot more now. And I know what some of you guys may be thinking. With all these modifications and accessories I've added, I may as well have just bought the Adventure Sports model. However, no, because I, if you'll remember, I did get a really good deal. I got this under 13,000 out the door um, with the heated grips and accessories installed with no labor costs um, as part of the deal and the first service. So it made a lot of financial sense for me in this case. Um, plus the overall idea of just having something that was a lot more capable off-road. Um, not that the Adventure Sports isn't, but um, this one is a lot lighter and does pretty well out here. But on the flip side of that argument, the one thing that I really wanted from the Adventure Sport models was tubeless spoked wheels, which this one does not have. From my understanding, the 2024 models, even the base now have tubeless spoked. Uh, so that's a pretty significant upgrade. I did look into it and I got a quote from my local dealership. Um, parts, install everything all in. It was going to be a couple thousand to convert to tubeless spoke. So at that point, it would have made sense for me to get the Adventure Sports model. But given the other um upgrades i did and the price i got on this bike it was worth it for me to stick with the base and i've actually been really happy with it and would likely do the same in the future just because for me and this is just a personal thing the idea of spending over fifteen thousand on a bike for me and my situation that's a bit daunting um, when it starts approaching car prices um, that's when i start really reevaluating what i'm doing so i'm pretty happy with this and this parallel twin has a surprisingly good sound to it. So I'm going to go ahead and show you that now. Let's check it out. All right, let's talk about how it does off-road. Uh, it's a pretty easy dirt road, so nothing too crazy here. The thing that's slightly annoying is if I want to turn off the ABS, not that I really need to for this road, but if I were to, I have to do it every time I turn the bike on. Um, and then it asks me, would you really like to cancel ABS rear wheel? Yes. So I have to go through that process every time. Again, not the biggest deal, but somewhat annoying. Uh, Off-road does great. Like I said, the Carew Street tires are not the best in general, but for stuff like this, totally fine. No issues. This is relatively packed. Um, while we're off-road here, I'll go ahead and talk about the standing height or the standing position. It's amazing. Um, I think it's great. I have no issues with it at all. Um, in fact, I even think the foot pegs are fairly generous for being stock. Um, I have really had no issues wanting to replace them. However, um, the sole of my enduro boot is pretty stiff and it just feels like one big peg anyway. So that could be a factor. Um, the handlebar height's good enough for me. I'm, for reference, I'm 5'11". And uh, yeah, actually it could be about an inch taller, but I'm not really having to hunch down too much at all, really, to, to grab that while I'm riding. And I will say this is one of the places that the DCT really shines is off-road. But yeah, it's great that you can just cruise around and not have to worry about shifting, uh, which isn't too big of a deal as you're standing on a bike with a clutch, but it is just that much more of a carefree feeling in my mind. So by the way, I'm in Corrales, New Mexico right now, which is just by Albuquerque. It's a very beautiful farming community and it's one of my favorite rides. It's definitely a slower paced ride like this the whole way. Uh, but there's a lot of neat architecture and houses to see. In fact, let me show you this road up here that's really neat. You're going to have to take my word for it that it is stunningly beautiful every other time of the year except for January. Everything's dead right now. Check out this road. In the fall with all these trees just completely golden color. It's so gorgeous, even in the summer too. There's a lot of little areas like this in Corrales though, so fun place to explore, nice place to ride. And there's also a lot of little shops and coffee places and whatnot. 
All right, let's get into the comfort of the bike. So starting with seat height, um, I am for reference 5'11 with a 32 inch inseam and I can easily, well I won't say easily flat foot, but I can flat foot it. Uh, there is a slight, very slight bend in my knee when I do so. Um, now I will say the pegs are kind of in an odd position. They are right where your leg would want to be. So they're, if it were up to me, I would have put the pegs just an inch or two further forward on this bike. But um, even with that, yes, I can flat foot it in, and that's with the seat in the low position. Um, the seat does come with the two positions, high and low, and mine is currently in low. Um, so wind protection. So right now with the tall windscreen from Honda installed, the wind just barely clears my helmet. If anything, maybe it's uh, touching the top inch of my helmet, but certainly no buffeting. I am in a nice bubble right now, even in the summer. And in the summer, I actually sometimes get a little warm and wouldn't mind a little bit more wind hitting me. But every other time of year, it is definitely appreciated and works very well. So overall ergonomics and rider triangle, um, it's pretty comfortable riding position. I am fully upright. I have a slight reach forward in my arms, but not, not very much at all. The seat is pretty comfortable. I have a lot of places to be on it. I can scoot forward as it narrows and still be pretty comfortable, uh, as well as scoot back and get to the wider part of the seat so I can shift around on the longer rides. Also under comfort would be cruise control, which currently works great. Now, there was an issue with the cruise control that uh, Honda did fix under warranty, which I will talk about at the end of this video under the issues area but uh, currently it is working great so the turn signals are fine they're self-canceling that functions okay let's see if it does it now so i have the turn signal on what it tends to do is after i complete the turn it tends to hang on to the signal a little bit too long or turn off early so right now i just did the turn still going still going and then it turned off so just a very, very small thing, not a huge gripe at all. Hey, so I'm here with my wife, Desiree, and she's gonna tell us about the passenger accommodations. So my favorite thing about riding on the back of the Africa Twin is definitely the seat height. I can see what's coming towards me, but I'm not sitting so high up that I feel exposed, but I'm not directly behind the main rider where I can't see anything but a helmet. Um, I definitely like the peg placement. My legs are not touching the exhaust or anything where they're getting really hot. So I've had that on a couple bikes. Um, also, it's a very comfortable position. Um, the seat itself is not too hard or too soft, it's fairly comfortable. I wouldn't say it's the best, but it's not horrible. Um, it's definitely good for a one to two hour ride at max. Um, and then the grab bars on the back are definitely easily accessible and I say very sturdy for those longer rides as well. Let's get into the DCT. This is my favorite thing. I love talking about this um, because there are so many mixed opinions about this. And I love hearing all the different reasons for liking it or hating it. Uh, so let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on the DCT, the dual clutch transmission, um, essentially a Honda's automatic shifter. For those of you who don't know what it is, it feels like a car shifter, basically, just an automatic transmission. But from a practical standpoint, that's what the experience is like, is like a car. A lot of people say, well, then you're not on a motorcycle, you're on a big scooter. And to that I say, scooters are great I love scooters <laughs> it's awesome in fact my other bikes just have a traditional clutch I love riding this thing because it's just one less thing to think about it's not I've been riding for 18 years it's not like having to shift is something I really think about much anyway it's just that it allows me to just enjoy the ride that much more and just cruise and not think about those things um, because it does it all automatically off-road it's nice because it's practically impossible to stall um, in first gear, you really have no issues with that. It eliminates it. And if I want to shift, um, I can take over at any point. I don't have to turn into a different rider mode or anything. I have paddle shifters here on my left so I can shift down gears or up at any point. And if I shift the gears too low for its liking and it'll hang on to it for a second and then eventually it shifts back up on its own. Uh, but even if you want more control than that, you can use this button right here on my right, flip it over to fully manual mode, and you can, there's a guy in the middle of the road here, and you can shift down and up, and it will hang on to those gears all day, just like a traditional gearbox would. 
So there's a lot of layers of control with this. And it's actually my second DCT bike. Um, I'll put a picture of it on the screen here, but my first one was a very unusual bike called the Honda NM4. And that one actually goes by the name Voltus in other markets outside the US. But that bike was crazy. I'll have to do a video about that one at some point, but it's got a really interesting story as well along with it. But that bike also was a DCT and I absolutely loved it. Um, so it is different than a CVT transmission than you would find in a scooter, you know, that continuous variable. Um, so a little different there, but um, super smooth gear shifts. Like even right now it's downshifting. I'm not even thinking about it. And it just put me into third gear. So with that, we can go into rider modes. Um, right now I'm in drive, which, man, I think I'm the only Africa Twin user out there who actually enjoys drive mode. Drive is the Africa Twin's most economical mode. Um, essentially, its goal in this mode is to try to get you to the highest gear possible all the time uh, for fuel economy reasons. Of course, with that comes the sacrifice of power and not being in the middle of the power band. But when I'm just cruising around, especially commuting, I'm looking for a fuel economy. And if I'm not trying to be a street Rossi, which I rarely do on this bike, then it's a perfect mode for that. However, it does come with sport modes. Um, so to switch, all you do is just hold down here, bottom right with my thumb to drive to sport mode. Now I'm currently have mine set to sport two. There's three levels. Sport two is a pretty balanced and aggressive approach to shifting. Um, it allows it to, oh, that's a nice house. What the hell? Damn. Anyway, um, with sport two, it does keep the gears relatively low so that you have a lot of get up and go power all the time. Um, and it is pretty intuitive. In fact, when I'm on a spirited ride, maybe on a mountain road somewhere or in a canyon. Uh, it does shift pretty intuitively, just like how I would on my own if it were a fully manual bike. Um, so you see right now it's in third gear. And if I was to shift back to drive, it's probably gonna go up a gear or two, fourth gear. So yeah, that's the difference between the two. Um, and they both work well for my usage. All right, while we're off the bike, let's go ahead and go through the modifications I've done to this Africa Twin base model. So starting at the front here, we have the tall windscreen. This is the Honda OEM tall windscreen. The one it came with only went to about here. Um, now, there is a lot of bike out in front of you as you're riding, so there is a good amount of wind protection, but I just wanted it to clear my head, or at least nearly clear my head, and it does. It does a much better job of that. I've been really happy with this particular one. I do highly recommend it. Um, and like I mentioned before when I did the dash, we have this OEM part from Honda that does cover the windscreen. Um, the reason for that is because apparently this tall windscreen or any tall windscreen can potentially have like a magnifying glass effect on the TFT and this prevents that. Um, I think that would probably be a pretty rare circumstance. Like you'd really have to get it just right for that to happen. I haven't noticed anything like that. But really the reason I wanted it was because I wanted the TFT to not be getting UV exposure from the sun all the time. And so now like 90% of the time my screen is covered from the sun and I just feel a lot better uh, having done that. Some other modifications would be the power outlet that was installed here by the dealership. This is the OEM power outlet, 12 volt. Um, and the giant loop bag, which is really, really nice to keep a lot of small accessories in like garage door openers, phone, um, iPhone cords, things like that. Um, the bark busters also were added. Um, they've been great. Uh, we've had a couple of light falls here in the sand and they have been fine and held up really well so far. Okay, moving over to the side of the bike. Uh, I did a lot of research on crash bars and skid plates and I wanted one that where they worked in tandem together um, to offer more protection. And uh, the Outback Motor Tech brand kept coming up a lot and so I ended up going with those. They've been really great. They survived a couple falls already as you can see from the scuff marks here. Um, this one actually did come like that from the factory which was kind of odd but one thing that is worth noting though, I've only had like two or three kind of light falls at low speeds in the dirt here and this kind of softer dirt um, with this bike, but uh, they are, they have shifted over to the side a little bit. I'm sure I can correct that pretty easily by loosening and readjusting, but you'll notice that um, they have protected the bike. Everything's good, but they're very close on this side. And then on this side, there's quite a bit of separation there. So I can see that they are shifting a little bit. Um, so I'll have to adjust for that and hopefully nothing's bent. But otherwise, I cannot complain about them. Um, now, I am a huge fan of these bags, um, the Tusk Olympus series soft bags. 
absolutely fantastic cannot re recommend them enough um, you've got a lot of storage I believe it's 40 liters um, per side and the fact that they just have these extra side pockets um, I have water in there um, and you know the whole soft luggage versus hard luggage debate to me the only place hard luggage wins out is if you never plan on going off-road and of course you can get into them a lot easier than these with these there are four straps you need to undo each time but I've gotten pretty quick at it and I don't really even think about it anymore there's a waterproof bag liner inside it so everything does stay dry I've tested that uh, been really happy with them I have also on the XT250 the Tusk pilot bags i believe they're called which are just slightly smaller and those have held up really well as well i use those for the bdr here in new mexico these tusk bags did come with their own brand rack as well now to put this rack on it did take a little bit of doing and some new parts um, so the africa twins backside here at least on the base model um, did not come with these mounting points by default they're in there but they're covered by a fairing that i had to remove and you have to buy this part from honda um, so I'll put this part in the description and I will also link a really helpful video by a gentleman who shows you how to install this so that you can then open up and have these mounting points on your bike as well. Um, this part here, unfortunately from Honda, was a little expensive. It was somewhere between $400 and $500. So a little pricey there, but it allows again for these mounting points to be exposed so that you can mount as well as adding some sort of top case up here. This modification, I know a lot of you guys do something like this. Um, I actually learned about this one from Tim at 40 times around um, and it has been a great modification so this case it's just one of those pelican style cases although this one's from harbor freight it was about 50 or 60 bucks um, all you do is you get the case you get a cutting board you get two of these cutting boards from walmart or from wherever um, they're about two or three dollars each you just use four bolts to install and it has been rock solid it does not go anywhere um, and i've had it on there for a while now and a lot of off-road use um, really great on the bottom side four bolts super easy to remove if I ever want to another cutting board back here just to protect everything um, has been absolutely fantastic like I said really solid nice that it's really secure and that it does have these holes here I did buy two locks so that I could lock these um, and so if I ever have valuables in there I do that and uh, Costco chicken does fit in there in case you're wondering and of course the heated grips which are the Honda OEM ones in this particular case I recommend going with OEM uh, I do like Oxford's they're great they do really well but the OEM ones integrate really nicely with the electronics already on the bike you turn them on using the buttons that already exist so there's no need to add a separate module on the handlebars um, so I'll show you how that works uh, if you want to turn them on it's simple as just using the function button right here up and down now if it defaults to volume which it is right now on the bottom it's showing volume for like headphones um, or for your cardo connection you just use this function to switch it over and you are now controlling the heat of the handlebars and it does automatically turn off when the bike is turned off and when you turn it back on it will keep that memory and resume heating up the grips which is nice all right let's talk about problems and there have been some with this bike um, three notable ones for sure and one that other people mentioned as a problem i'll start with that one um so a lot of people mentioned in their videos about how long the screen takes to load i it doesn't bother me i'll show you but here we go i usually start my bike now and just start going so i don't see why it's an issue and it loads in the background while i'm just starting off the drive You don't have to hit okay well yeah see it'll just go on to the next screen so it doesn't bother me i don't know that's just me um but anyway the other issues though so it had two issues right from the factory um and like i said one of them was kind of significant the first one was the cruise control didn't work so i actually caught it on video a couple times so rather than explaining i'll just show you right now africa twin here on saturday Pushing this button does not engage the light here. Let's see if I can go wider here. But if I turn it off and on, that will temporarily fix it. So that was mildly annoying, but it was fixed under warranty. 
and it has been fine since. Um, and so the second issue, and this was kind of the bigger one for me, um, again, nothing major, but definitely notable. The bike would stall when accelerating from a stop, I would say about once a week. Um, it was something that happened regardless of the engine's temperature, whether it was warmed up or not. In fact, I would say it happened more often when the engine was warm already. And it didn't matter what mode I was in. It didn't matter if I did a hard acceleration or a gentle acceleration. It was just, I would give it gas. You would hear the RPMs just back down a little bit and they would die. And there was just no saving it. And um, so that was what we have here, Royal Enfield, nice. So that was mildly annoying, um, especially when there's a line of cars behind you. And like I said earlier, I commute on this. So sometimes that was a thing. So I finally got some time to research a little bit online and I found that there was indeed a software recall for this specific problem. And so I had that fixed about a month ago now. It's January, I had it fixed about December. And so here's the weird thing. It has been fixed except for one time. The first ride after they did the software update, which supposedly fixes that problem. Some horses here. Hey, horses. That first ride back from the dealership, it stalled in my garage while I was just giving it a little gas to move forward. But every other ride since then, totally fine. So it seems like it's fixed, minus that first ride back. I don't know, it's weird. Um, and you know, side note, you know, the more tech is added to these bikes, the more problems there are. And that's kind of my reasoning for getting the XT250 as well as that Harley Sportster because they're just simple bikes and there's less to go wrong. Not that I don't like the tech, but anyway, bells and whistles, right? So that was the second issue. And the third issue, I will actually show you in my garage because it's pretty reproducible and there's a workaround for it, but check it out. Before we get into the issue of the Apple CarPlay, just for context, whenever you're doing Apple CarPlay on a motorcycle, specifically the Africa Twin, um, not only do you plug in your phone like normal, like you would on a car, you also need to pair something to the bike to function as a headset. Um, in this case, I'm gonna be using the Cardo, but you could also do a pair of wireless earbuds or whatever, as long as there's some sort of connection. Um, the thing that's weird about the Apple CarPlay, and this is reproducible, this problem, is for whatever reason, if I connect the headset to the bike first, then plug in the phone, the screen gets pretty glitchy and it doesn't work properly. However, if I switch that and I connect the phone and then the headset, it works fine for whatever reason. And that's weird because even on Honda America's uh, video about setting up the CarPlay on YouTube, they connect things in the order that does not work for my particular bike. So it's very odd, but I'll show you the problem first. So like I said, turn the bike on. And if I were to do the headset first, so that's turning on and eventually that will connect and then I plug in the phone, the screen will get kind of glitchy and won't work well. Um, but then I'll reverse that and it'll be fine. So, okay, bike connected, headset good. And then I connect the phone and I'll show you the problem here. Okay, so with that, I try to switch to CarPlay. And here's where it gets weird. CarPlay, and it goes back a screen. It's like the phone just disconnected. And then, I don't know if you see that flicker that just happened, but it'll do that over and over. Try, try it again, and it's reverting back a screen for whatever reason, not allowing me to access the CarPlay. But, turn that off, turn this off, and disconnect. This time, I will connect the phone first, then do the headset, and it'll work. So, Africa Twin on, connect the phone, and once it's ready, it's going to say, you need to have a headset paired, and you can actually ignore that screen by hitting the back button right here. So once that pops up, okay, so here's the screen asking to pair a headset. I'm just going to hit the back button and hold it, and that will go away. 
And there we go, all good. There's the CarPlay, and I can access any of the things that I need to. And then I can connect the headset. So, and it'll work now. Totally not a big deal, but it's just kind of annoying that I have to do it that way, which is different than the way they show on their own instructional videos, but it's just the nature of how it is. Well, you might be wondering, is it a software update? But the thing is, I just got the software updated because of the stalling issue that it had. And so they did that under warranty. So theoretically, this is the latest software for the bike. And so I'm afraid to make any changes. And if I do have software updated or checked, will it unfix the stalling problem? So I don't know. But anyway, that's the issue with your Apple CarPlay. Um, totally functional. Don't mean to complain about it. But uh, it is something worth mentioning. So coincidentally, while filming this video, I got a letter from Honda and I saw that there were a couple posts about this on the forum as well, talking about an extension on the warranty of the TFT screen, which they refer to as the MID multi-information display. But uh, it is for 2020 through 2022 model year Africa Twins, um, saying that it may not function correctly at high temperatures, and you can identify this problem by the touch being non-responsive, rider modes changing unexpectedly, or the trip data resets. So that's fun. But the good news is, kudos to Honda. They're actually really taking care of us. Um, they're extending the warranty on that particular item until 2033. I'll put a screenshot of this up for you guys, but I thought it was worth noting that this did happen while I was filming this video. So the Africa Twin does almost everything well, and I can't really fault it for its size and weight on tougher single track that the XT250 eats up. My intent was to make it my go-to bike for longer trips and adventures because once I got to some new destination, I then wanted to go explore some dirt roads. But my long distance bike almost always ends up being the XT250 because once I get to some new destination, I can go almost anywhere from there without any limit. The Africa Twin, in my opinion, just limits me a little bit because of that. And that could, of course, just be a testament to my rider skill at this point in my life. But an example of this is a friend and I did the southern half of the New Mexico backcountry discovery route this last summer, and there was a big mud section, and I was on the XT250, and I got through it just fine and even had a lot of fun during that section. Had I been on this, I think I would have been a little bit nervous, probably not enjoying it as much and just wanting it to be over. So I'm really glad that I took the smaller bike for that particular ride. And we'll probably continue to choose the XT250 for similar rides in the future. We're all looking for that unicorn bike that doesn't really exist. So usually we have to choose between some sort of compromise on the highway versus on the trail. For me and my comfort levels and the type of riding I like to do, I would rather accept the loss of performance on the highway to truly not be limited once I'm out somewhere new, rather than the opposite. And I know some people would rather compromise the other way, getting that highway performance to get you there for the long haul, and then maybe not having quite as much capability off-road or being able to get in tight spaces. And to those people, that's great. But for me, that's just the way I choose. And if you're lucky enough to have two bikes in the garage, uh, I think the best of both worlds is to have a large adventure bike and to have something small like an XT250 or a CRF300L. But if I was forced to make the choice of just keeping one bike in the garage, it would definitely be the lighter one. That being said, for every other use case, I do believe the Africa Twin is superior. That includes commuting or any long tours that are biased towards the road. I just think that this is gonna do a lot better for all those use cases, including the wind protection. That's a huge plus. You're always gonna see marketing from companies like Honda that show a professional rider on bikes like these, completely tearing it up, doing single track, riding in deep sand, going up dunes. But for most of us, we're not gonna be taking bikes like this in those situations. And putting the marketing aside, I think Honda is really alluding towards the intended use case of this bike by including street tires with it. I do think they kind of know that it's gonna be predominantly a road bike for a lot of people. But despite the warranty work that this bike has had, in addition to the TFT potential issues it might have with the extended warranty that Honda just released, I did decide to purchase a five-year warranty on this bike one, because 
I really like it a lot and I actually plan to keep it. We'll see how long it sticks around. But two, there's a lot of tech on here and a lot of things to go wrong. So with that, I do want to make sure that I'm covered if there's a situation in the future with either the DCT or any of the electronics. I'm never really worried about the engine itself though. I'm confident it's gonna start every time. I'm confident it's gonna run well. So it's got it where it counts. But because of all the extra bells and whistles on it, I do think the warranty was a good purchase in my particular case. Normally I don't buy those, but with all the electronics on this, I think it was important to get. But as of now, I do plan to keep it for the foreseeable future because it really is an amazing bike. Those of you who don't have an Africa Twin, I'd be really curious to know, do you think it's too big? Do you think there's too many things going on with the electronics and Apple CarPlay? Or is it right up your alley? And also, if you have one, have you had any issues with yours? I'm really curious to see how they've been holding up over the years, especially as we get into the 2024 models. So let me know in the comments. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and we'll catch you in the next one.